Do you remember the first piece of jewellery that you ever fell in love with? My dad had, it sounds quite decadent, but he had a gold toothpick in this beautiful 18 karat yellow gold carved case that you'd unscrew and then it would reveal this toothpick. And I used to borrow it from him when I was a young teenager and wear it to the school disco and felt, if we remember school disco, well, it takes it back a bit, school discos. <laughs> but I used to wear it to um, school discos. I felt very cool in it because nobody else had anything like that. It was beautiful, long gold cylinder. And it's, looking back now, I kind of look at the things that we create now and how I connect to that kind of shape as well. But it was, it was, it was my favorite piece of jewelry. You mentioned you know, this love of objects, but what were your sort of aspirations when you, when you were a child? Were you thinking about that as a career or did you not, were you academic? How did it, what were you dreaming of? <clears throat> yeah, I was very interested in the, creat the creative arts and the creative classes, and, but there, was, there wasn't very many at the school that I was at. So they didn't really cater for that. So I became a little bit of a rebellion at that school because there was nothing really interesting me or nothing really for me to focus on. Mm. Luckily, my careers officer at that school recognised that I had a skill. He asked me what did I want to do, so I said that I wanted to do, I wanted to be a fashion designer. You know, it was the 80s and <laughs> I was just, everybody wanted to be a fashion designer, but I wanted to, I wanted to work in fashion. Well, not necessarily fashion, but that was the field I wanted to work in. But I was too young to do that at the time or go to any school for that because we needed to, I wanted to do a further education. I wanted to actually leave school early. So they were trying to help me do that with a further education. But he found this design course in jewellery, which was a further education for one year. It was like a foundation course, but basically in jewellery design and manufacture. So I applied to do that and I got onto the course. It was in Kingsway Princeton College in Sands Walk in Clerkenwell. My tutor recognised I had a skill and again I became a little bit rebellious at college because I'd finished my six <laughs> months, I'd finished all my project work so I'd still had six months to go on the course. So I, my attention started to sway again and my tutor was concerned and he said look you've really got a skill here, you need to tune in on this. He said what do you want to do when you leave this course? And I said well I want to go into fashion and he was well you're good at jewellery design, you're good at making, you have a really good skill and your attention, your attention to detail, detail is, is, is perfect. Um, so he suggested the apprenticeship. He said, why don't you do an apprenticeship in Hatton Garden, which was the jewellery course of London at the time, and learn to be a goldsmith. And at first I was a little, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I loved the craft, I loved the skill, but fashion, I had this mm. idea of fashion in my head as a young person, that's kind of, I was kind of driven to that direction. But Luckily, I didn't. I thought, well, he said, do it, take up the apprenticeship, and if you like it, carry through, and if you don't, leave and do something, well, move, move more into fashion. At least it will get you in that design mm. area, that design ar arena, so you can really experiment in that, um, in that arena and get used to design, really, the things, you know, get your brain used to that kind of approach. Um, so I did, I started, I took on the apprenticeship, it was a seven year apprenticeship working for a, an amazing workshop in Hatton Garden that um, made all the beautiful high end fine jewellery for all the Bond Street stores. So it was funny, the two, the, two, the two masters who taught me, I went for the interview and they, um, I think they could see that I was a little bit uh, rebellious, but to a degree they saw my work that I'd done already, they could see that I had a skill, but they were very strict. And they were like, right, when you work with us, it's you start at eight, you finish at six, you don't speak, you learn, you have a break, you're an apprentice, you do all the running around, you do all the, the, you know, the jobs that an apprentice does. And, but the good thing was they sat me in between them, there were two masters, and they taught me everything they knew about jewellery and goldsmithing. And that was it, I was done. I, I didn't, I, I, I'd found what I'd been looking for. I was getting all this information, I was absorbing it like a sponge. It's a real, graph but the beautiful thing about it is their stages you know you first start working on copper you know you start on copper you have to get all your piercing skills correct before you're allowed to move on to silver so you kind of set these targets mm -hmm. and I think the beautiful thing about London or Hatton Garden at that time because it was 30 years ago when I started my apprenticeship there were other apprentices in the garden as well you know there was about 50 of us 
in, in Hatton Garden at the time. So when we were all on our lunch breaks, we'd all go out and like, what are you working on? I'm working on this. Or, are you on silver now? Or are you on, you know, have you moved from copper? It's like your bronze badge, silver badge, gold badge that. at swimming, you know? So it was like, are you on? So we'd compare with each other. So, and, and I, I was lucky, I was fast. I learned really, really quickly. And the, the gratification of making something, starting a day, with a piece of metal and then forming it and then by the end of the day you've formed or end of two days depending on the piece you've formed a piece and it's going to be around for like a hundred years or mm. 200 years because of the materials it's made from it's got that longevity what was the point where you sort of got itchy feet and you wanted to do something on your own where you got you mentioned before that you were into the making but not the design what was the point where the kind of the design element started to get you really excited i think what happened for years i worked with this company and we made beautiful jewelry um, we went through phases, we made um, kind of the different styles, so it was kind of, we would do the run of the mill, like solitaires, coronet clusters, tiaras, very classic jewellery. Then we went through a phase of making jewellery for the Middle East, so it was bigger pieces with much more, it was much more about the stones than it was about the detail in the gold. So we went through phases. But I think one of my favourite phases was when we did antique restoration. That's when the design element came in for me. Because I would restore Victorian, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and I could see, I could see a distinct, you, you could recognise dis, a distinctive style. And they were, mm -hmm. so, they were close to each other, but so different, so innovative. Like the progression from Victorian to Art Nouveau, then to Art Deco. The Art Deco is so much more bolder and geometric, geometric to the to the ornate of the Victorian, but they were so distinctive of their time. I started looking at these pieces, thinking, "It's, it's so recognisable. Who made this? And mm. all the love and care that went into these pieces. And it's so distinctive. It's Victorian. I I would know instantly. And I kind of respected my past masters for that because they were producing pieces that made statements of the days they lived in. And they were being really innovative with the use of materials. Like Victorians were very innovative with the use of materials mm -hmm. and the sentiment that was attached to their jewellery, you know, morning jewellery with mm -hmm. the locks of hair, etc. And it was then I started looking, thinking, well, it's, I would really love to design my own jewellery that is a, it kind of sh is a statement of the times that we live in now. Because I must admit, at that time I was getting pretty bored of the jewellery around me because it was, it was it, we'd gone into a real mass production era. The mm. trade goes through so many different phases, like any industry I presume, but mm. the trade had gone through a very much mass production time and, and, and I, I felt that the, that, that intricacy had been lost of one-off pieces and pieces like that, that and a real respect for fine detail had been watered down somewhat. So then I really fell in love with the pieces that I'd seen these antiques were a real good example of what fine jewellery and craftsmanship and design should be. Mm. So that's when I kind of fell in love with design. Mm. And then through a moment of serendipity I met Alexander McQueen and then off we went. Why did you get on so well? What was it that sort of sparked that connection? We became friends um, through, a, through a mutual friend while he was at um, Central St Martins and doing his MA. And we, we became um, just good friends and he was coming up to his graduation year and he would come and meet me after work every other day and would go out as, you know, young teenagers. Well, we were, in, we were just turned 20 then, so, you know, <laughs> as you do. And, um, and then sometimes he would come up to my workshop to pick me up from work and then we'd go out. And he was fascinated by what he saw, what, because, our workshop was very, it was like, it's very old and very Victorian. It was like going back in time. It was like Oliver Twist. You know, you'd go up these rickety old stairs and then there'd be this bench with half moons cut out where you would sit with leather skins collecting the gold dust. It's, it's, it's quite romantic. Mm. And he, he was quite fascinated with it. And, and it's old tools, it's the old flames. It's very, it's still very similar to how it was 100 and 150 years ago. And, um, he was fascinated by the works that I was creating. He saw the pieces that I was restoring. He saw the tiaras I was making and the detail. And he was, he, I think he was impressed by the one, the attention to detail and the level of craftsmanship. 
And him having come, in, come from a Savile Row background, I think he, he respected. Yeah. It, 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 it kind of, the, his, his background and mine kind of mirrored each other in a way, because I came from a very traditional goldsmithing background where he had come from a very traditional Savile Row background. He was fascinated by my, 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 my skills as a craftsman and, and the, the level of work, the high level of work that we were working on. And that's when he asked me to create pieces for his shows. He said, when I graduate, will you work with me and create pieces for my shows? Mm. And at first I found that quite daunting because I was a, I was kind of a conditioned goldsmith. He could see I was hungry. I had a feisty side to me. I was young. I was energetic. I wanted to. I wanted to make a statement. I wanted to kind of make a statement of the times that we lived in, really. Mm. And uh, he saw the hunger in me. He saw that I had that element, which he had too. And we were the same age, and we were of the same. He was East London, I was a North London boy. We kind of had the same energies, so we fed off each other quite brilliantly, I thought. Mm. It's interesting you keep saying hunger because one of the first shows that you kind of, it was the second McQueen's second show and you worked really closely together, it was called The Hunger. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, tell yeah. me about that show because you um, did a small piece for Highland Rape, didn't you? But The Hunger was where it kind of all really came together. Yeah, you're right. The first show I worked on was The Highland Rape, and, um, and that was really interesting because obviously it was, I, I, he, Lee had seen me make. He'd worked with lots of Victorian restoration pieces of that. So he wanted me to make fob watch chains as an accessory for the clothes. And what I loved about Lee was at that time, you know, this was the first time I'd ever worked with him. I thought he's going to drape them from pocket to chain like the <laughs> Victorians did. You know, I never worked with a fashion designer before. I didn't have a perception of what he was going to do with these chains, but he didn't. You know, he draped these chains between skirts and he draped them, I think from through the back of the skirt, going through the skirt to come out and hang down the front of it. Because people said it looked like the models had like tampons. I love the way he did that. He took something old and he made it new and put it somewhere different. Yeah. And that was the beginning. And then working with him, then that's how I started to think. So when Lee approached me to do The Hunger, it was, on the back of what we'd done for Highland Rape. So I created this beautiful stag horns in silver, very refined, very elegant, that were placed at the front of the skirt. And while doing that process, then I started to get really excited. And I thought, right, what else can we do? And, and Lee said, look, we need some earrings. We need something. I need like one earring. I just need an earring to connect all the girls. And I need it to have an animalistic feel. And I kind of want it to be quite strong and da and then I came up with the um, elephant tusk. That's where my signature was born, and you'll see that handwriting runs through my work ever mm. since, and that was 1994. And it, you said that he really challenged and, produ and sort of pushed you, because you, know, you did get to these points where you're making sort of full body sculptures, and some of them, as you, as you kind of hinted at, were really, really controversial. Were you kind of aware of how challenging the stuff that you were producing was, or did you not think like that when you were working? No, on I'm glad you brought that up, because we it's only now I look back and reflect on that. At the time, at the time, yes, it was challenging to create those mm. pieces, but at, at the time I didn't think about I was changing the world's perception of jewellery or, yeah. or I was just changing my own. Sometimes Lee would come to me and he'd know what he wanted, he'd have a vision of what he wanted to create. And then when it got into the body sculpture, Lee did approach me and um, he asked me, he said, I, I, I've got a piece I want you to make for one of the shows. He said, I want you to make me a skeleton corset. And at that point I thought he had either lost the plot or I was losing the plot <laughs> and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I said, in, in what way? He said, I want you to make me a skeleton corset that on the outside of the girl with all the rib cage and I want a spine and I want it going all down her back. And uh, at the then, that was I think my first challenging piece ever because that had, I had gone from being a goldsmith to a silversmith, now to a sculptor in a way. So I had to then, and at first I said, Lee, that's, in, that's impossible. I, 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 I wouldn't know how to do that. And he was like, sure, nothing's impossible. And that's something I've carried with me ever since. And there I was, then making a skeleton corset out of aluminium, <laughs> a material I never ever thought I would work with. And the funny thing is now, 
we work with it still, but we, we, we create fine jewelry in aluminium and we set it with diamonds because of the weight. Mm. Um, so I made the corset, it worked. It was a very, very difficult piece to make. Um, we made it, it was a success, and then that opened the door to then what me and, what me and Lee together could achieve. Because then he knew that I could do that. So there was no boundaries then. There was no limit to what we wanted to do. And I think together we had a really beautiful experience because there were no boundaries. And he gave me such a creative platform. I was free to design pieces that there were no commercial constraints. There, I, there, these pieces weren't for sale. They were, it was a platform where I could just create what I felt jewelry should be, where it should go, play with different materials, create different silhouettes. So. Yeah, it was an amazing journey. Mm. And then we went from the skeleton corset to the coil corset to the spear dress. I mean, that piece was, that went against the laws of gravity. In the years since Lee's passing, tell me about how you've sort of, yeah, worked on your own and kept having those inspirations. And because now you're your own man doing amazing jewellery, people coming to you. What, how, where do you draw most of your inspiration from? Lee and Isabella were, they, 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 they were, inspiring people they were two very very important people in my life and um, they always loved to create and discover and creation was what it was about and I think what I took from that I'd worked with them for so long that that was in that energy was embedded in me mm. so I felt I need to carry I need to continue and I need to create I need to carry on being innovative and avant-garde and I need to push the, I need to carry on pushing the boundaries and in a way, for me, it was I was creating for them, but through my eyes. So it's kind of that, that energy helped me carry on to be my own man and carry on and build the house of Sean Lean and, and be what it is today, to be honest. And I still feel that, that energy and I still want to push the boundaries and I still contain that energy. I think it's really important. You know, there, there, there's been so many times when we could have commercialised and become middle of the road and made millions and you know gone a totally different direction but I want to create jewelry that takes people's breaths away really.